Okay, grab a seat, please. We'll get going. We're glad you're with us. All right. Thank you. Have a seat, please. Thank you. Felt like I'm at a concert. All right. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, if you will. Mark chapter 6. We'll get there in a little bit. We started last week with the miracles of Jesus. Brian kicked us off this uh, study. If you had a, since this is March, oh, I probably need to stand behind here, don't I? Most of the time. It's going <laughs> you can be a little bit over this way. In fact, you might. I don't know. Might be preferred. What do you think? I don't know. All right. Like? Is it good? Is he okay? All right. Since this is a March Madness, I thought for a second we'd uh, talk about brackets. I'm sure it was all blown up with Ohio State losing. And I'm sure, like me, none of you picked Abilene Christian either last night. But if you did, like Hannah Dobbs, shout out to her. She did pick them. But if you had to rank the miracles in a bracket system, I would say the, the feeding of the multitudes that we're going to look at today would rank in the top four of miracles. And I say that because there are only, out of the 34 miracles that Jesus performed himself, there are only two that are found in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000 is one. What's the other one? What is the other miracle that is found, and it's not the 4,000? It's not the 4,000. So the 5,000 is in what, what, Chris? Raising from the dead is pretty high, I think. Raising? Jesus raised himself. Yeah. Well, God did that. again, yeah. Jesus performed the miracle. So that's the, that was the key in that phrase. Miracles that Jesus performed while he was living. Raising Not that one. I would have thought that too. What about the storm, calming the storm? Not the storm. It is the healing of Melchus's ear. That's what I was going to say. But only the healing part is in the Gospel of Luke, but the story is in all four Gospels. But the healing it is, is not in Matthew, Mark, or John. Okay, so those are the 5,000 and you got Melchus's ear, okay? We, we would say, man, big miracles because they show up in all four Gospels there, okay? So as we kick off our time, what is a miracle? What's a miracle? <laughs> that Mike came? No. <laughs> no. Praise Jesus. What's a miracle? It's usually something out of the ordinary. Something out of the ordinary. Okay. Something that has no earthly explanation. No earthly explanation. Something no one else could do. Something no one else could do. Something extraordinary. Extraordinary. Okay. Huh? <laughs> I didn't hear you, Linda. The Browns going to the Super Bowl. The Browns going to the Super Bowl, yes. <laughs> and winning it. <laughs> yes. Something that defies the natural laws. Okay, something that defies natural laws. Sue? When I was a kid, we had a record. And there was comedians, and old time comedians called Did Two Black Frozen Babies. And that was back in the 20s. You know, 30s. And then one of the guys described a miracle, and he said, you see that cow over in the field eating grass? That's not a miracle. You see that bird sitting on the thistle singing a song? That's not a miracle. But if you see that cow sitting on a thistle singing a song, <laughs> that's, that's a miracle. A miracle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. I, I like what everybody said and, and, and true. So I went back to good old Dan Webster. Maybe some of you went to school with him. 
Here's what he says in the New Dictionary. It is an event that apparently contradicts known scientific laws and an hence thought to be due to supernatural causes, especially to an act of God. Okay, that's how Webster's Dictionary defines a miracle, besides what we talked about. Now, what are some words that are used in the New Testament that describe an act of God? What are some words used to describe acts of God in the New Testament? Well, uh, signs. Okay, signs. Wonders. 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 Miracles or powers, mighty works, or work or works. Okay, signs. Evidence or uh, a proof of or proof of divine authority, power, and mission, referring to the purpose of that act. Wonders, something unusual, causing wonder and amazement. Miracles or powers or mighty works, power indicating works of supernatural origin. And those three words, signs, wonders, or first three, miracles or powers or mighty works, are used in Acts. 2 verse 22, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. All those are used uh, each time in a different order. The fourth, work or works, is found in the Gospel of John to denote the miracles of Jesus is a work or works and simply means an act or a deed there okay now, miracles have a purpose okay now they had a purpose in the new testament what do you think were the purpose of the miracles what are the purpose of the miracles that jesus performed what paul to show god's in power to prove who he was to what? Catch people's attention. Catch their attention. Show compassion. Show compassion, Ron. Cleansing. Cleansing. Okay. Well, healing. Right? Okay. But also to conf co to confirm the word, to produce faith in Jesus Christ, to show that God is with Jesus, to demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God as prophesied confirm the word mark 6 verse 16 verse 20 produce faith john 20 30 and 31 to show god is with jesus john 3 verse 2 to demonstrate things were prophesied isaiah 53 and verse 4. so just as a introduction or a background to what miracles are then brian shared with us the turning the Jesus turned the water into wine last week. And now we're going to look at the feeding of the multitudes here. The first is Mark chapter 6. The feeding of the 5,000. Can I get somebody to read Mark 6, verses 30 through 44? Mark 6, 30 through 44. All right, Alston, thank you. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. 
Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave to them his disciples, then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was five thousand. All right, thank you. What stands out to you in this miracle? What stands out? Two fish. The what? Two fish, five loaves of bread, and fed five thousand. Okay, so what he used to feed people, okay? The small amount to feed so many. The disciples were worried and concerned about providing food for these people. Okay. So they're concerned, but they're worried. The thing that stands out to me is Christ's answer when they ask. He said, in 37, but Jesus said, you feed them. Mm -hmm. That stands out to me. Okay. That, that had the floor. Okay, what do you think he's getting at? What do you in, 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 in physically or spiritually? Well, could it be both? <laughs> well, it, it, they were addressing the physical need, but he was talking about the spiritual okay. need. Okay, uh -huh. Brian? I mean, yep. he's been training them for ministry. When it said at the beginning that they returned to him, yeah. it's because they had been out two by two, Yep. Casting out demons and healing people, yep. and, and as a result, a lot of people are gathering around because yeah. a lot of good things are happening through yeah. Jesus and his disciples. And so now he's like, okay, now here's your next step. You got to learn now how to take care of yeah. all these followers who are coming. Right. Yep. So it's kind of a twofold, uh, Ron. Well, I mean, the five thousand is a miracle alone, but actually, if you read it the way it's written. It says the number of men who were for 5,000. There's probably more. Correct. Truth be told, right? Yes. I mean, there's probably times two, times three. Yeah. Because they're accompanied by their families or yes. whatever. Correct. So the number actually is... A lot 5,000 alone is yes. amazing. Yes. 5,000, that it would have counted in Bible time of the men. If you count the men. Yes. So you're talking a larger number of actual people that would have ate. Yep. That were fed. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think that if you're the one that sees the need, you're the ones being told to fulfill it. Yeah. yeah. If you see it, you you take care of it, right? But he's challenging challenging these disciples, isn't he? As Brian said there, and as uh, Sue brought up. All right. Uh, in this text, uh, where did Jesus take his disciples? Where does he take them? Up on a hill. Up to a hill. Okay. Why there? Let alone a hill. Where do they go first of all, though? Verse 32. They got in the boat to a solitary, quiet place. Right? Jesus is going to spend some time with his disciples. And so they go to this what they believe to be a solitary place. Okay? Now, what did the people do? They beat them there. <laughs> yes. So I started thinking about this, uh, of, of how we could understand this. Hopefully you've been to Cedar Point. For some of you, it might have been years ago. Okay? The only thing that has really changed are, are the the rides or the location of the rides and the stands. You're locked into a peninsula at Cedar Point. It's landlocked because of water, because you got the bay on one side and you got Lake Erie on the other side, okay? And so it hasn't grown any because they can't grow it because it's a peninsula, it's landlocked. So I started thinking, what if Jesus is, is there at Cedar Point and he wants to go to a solitary place and so he gets in a boat there at the marina of Cedar Point, and he heads to downtown Sandusky. But the people see Jesus at Cedar Point, and they begin to follow him. And so they start to walk down the causeway, leaving Cedar Point, 
They get to First Street, they hang a right in Sandusky, go down First Street, they get to Market, they hang another right, and they take that all the way down to Water Street, hang a left, and then they make their way to Jackson Street Pier. Did I give good enough directions, Ron? All right. <laughs> and there, they meet up with Jesus again. I think that's what we're talking about. They, they, it says that they saw him leaving, and so they went ahead. They, they start to make their way, maybe not that far, but they make their way around where he was to meet him to where he will be. Okay. Why? Why, why didn't they just stay where they were? <coughs> why, why didn't they just stay? Why? They've been experiencing wonderful things happening, yeah. and they want more. Yep, that's right. Yeah. So they run, they, they, they follow Jesus. Now, Jesus compared to people who followed him to what? Sheep. Okay, in verse 34 there. They're like, because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. He uses this opportunity, first of all, to teach them. Okay? And then when evening came, the disciples wanted Jesus to do what? According to 35 and 36. Send them away. Send the people away. Yeah. Send, send them down the way. Maybe there's hotels. Maybe there's a campground. Send them away to the countryside, the villages. So they can buy something to eat. It's kind of kind of funny. I was when I was reading this earlier, the, the disciples keep coming and telling Jesus things as if he doesn't know them already. Yeah. Like, hey, it's late. Did you notice it's late, Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> There's no food around here. That would cost a lot of money. Yes. You know, they, they, it, it's like they, they don't fully grasp that he's aware of all these things yeah. and, and has something in mind. Yeah. Don't you know, Jesus, they haven't built a 7-Eleven around here yet? <laughs> Don't you know, Jesus, like in my days growing up, the stores closed at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. They did not stay open 24 hours. Don't you know, Jesus, that this is a remote place. And what grabbed me this week is what he says at the end of verse 35. It was already very late. And don't we say sometimes things that really don't make sense when it's very late at night because we're tired. Send the people away so that they can get to the surrounding countryside and the villages so they can get something to eat. Yeah, Carol. One thing that I was thinking of in the whole context, it starts out, they, things were so crazy they didn't, didn't even have a chance to eat themselves. Jesus was taking them to a quiet place. Yeah. And there could be, you know, some some overwhelm and exhaustion and some resentment on the part of the disciples. Like, you know, we were going to a place, we were gonna hang out, we were gonna rest, and now here's all these people, so it's sort of a, you know, hey Jesus, remember the original plan? Can yeah. you just send them away? Yeah, that's right. You start to see their hangry pains, can't you? Because <laughs> they're hungry and they're angry. All right, hold your finger here and let's go to John 6 real quick and we'll come back to, to Mark 6. So leave Mark 6 with your finger there, go to John 6. Different part of the story. John chapter 6. First question is, what did Jesus say to Philip and why in verse 5 and 6? Uh, Brian, you got 5 and 6 real quick yeah. for us? Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Okay, thank you. What did Jesus say here then to Philip? Where are we going to get the bread? Where are we going to get the bread? All right. And what does Philip say? Where should we buy the bread? Says two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for them. All right. 
It's gonna, my version says it's going to take half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each of them to have something to eat. You know? In verse 7 there. Uh, but he said this to test him in verse 6. Because he already had in mind what he was going to do. All right? And Philip answered then, hey, it's going to take this long time for us to work to feed these people. And what did Andrew tell Jesus? Verse 8 and 9. Who's got that? Ron, you got 8 and 9? Yeah. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter, brother spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far would they go among, uh, among so many? All right. So what's Andrew tell him? Tells him a few things here. What's he tell him? We have a starting point. <laughs> we have what? We have a starting point. Okay, we got a starting point. Who's the starting point? The child. What are they going to start with? Who's Andrew starting with? The small lad. The, the boy, the small lad. Okay. The only one smart enough to bring something to eat. He, he, brought, he brought a meal. <laughs> or only smart enough not to eat it. We don't know. We'll bring it. <laughs> All right. But then he says, uh, we, got this, we found this boy with uh, five small barley loaves, two small fish. But how far will that go among so many? We, we found this kid and look what he's got. But on the other hand, oh, I don't know, man. That's not a lot. That's just a snack. And Jesus is saying, hey, you know what? That's all right. We got something. All right. There as well. Now, back to Mark 6, real quick. Back to Mark 6. What did Jesus command the disciples? Verse 39 and 40. What did he command his disciples? Get them organized. Get them organized, have them sit in hundreds and fifties. Why do you think that? walk amongst them. Okay, so they could walk among, they could serve them, they're organized, that they know, hey, we got a group over here that's not been fed, we got a table over here that needs some food. What did Jesus do before he gave the food to the disciples to distribute to all the people? Verse uh, 41. What's he do? Yeah. He blesses it, gives thanks. And then, how many baskets of leftovers did they gather? Twelve. Twelve. Twelve what? Twelve leftover pieces of bread and fish. Twelve baskets. <laughs> Picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish, and then the number of men were five thousand. All right, so we got that. That is... Uh, that one. Now go to chapter 8. We'll try to tie these together here real quick. Here is the 4,000. Chapter 8, 1 through 10. Chapter 8, 1 through 10. During those days, another large crowd followed. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to him, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I will, uh, if I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come from a long distance. The disciples answered, but where? But we're, we're in this remote place. Where can anyone find bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have, Jesus replied. He told the crowds, to, uh, seven they replied. He told the crowds to sit down on the ground, and when they had taken the seven loaves, he gave thanks, he broke it, and gave to the disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well, and he gave thanks to them also, and they dis uh, the disciples to distribute them, and the people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Uh, about 4,000 were present. They had... Uh, and then after he had sent him, them away, he got in the boat with the disciples and went uh, on to other regions there. 
All right. Now, before we jump into this, I asked you last week at the end of our time with Brian, I wanted you to read these stories and I wanted to talk about what is uh, very similar things in the two feedings and what are different. So first of all, what are some things that are similar in the 5,000 and the 4,000? I will feed for bread and fish. Okay. So you have bread, and both use fish and bread. Okay. In both, case, in both cases, you had an overwhelming number of people needing food. Okay, so both involved large amounts of people needing food. Was it you? The disciples didn't seem to have a clue as to what to do. Okay, they don't have a clue in both. Both times you told them to sit down on the ground. Okay. Told them to, them to, them to them. sit down. What else is si uh, similar? They have a small amount of food with which to work with. Okay, there's a small amount. Same kind of food from the other. Huh? It was the same kind of food. Okay, the same kind. It both include the bread and, and the fish. Yeah. Who? Oh, Anthony. The leftovers were the Bible's favorite numbers. Okay. <laughs> they were. Both miracles happened after he gave thanks. Okay. So both after he gave thanks. So there's a large amount of people. We talked about that. There's a location where food wasn't available in both. Small amount of food used to feed in both. Fish and bread used in both. Jesus and his disciples were in both. All right. We didn't talk about that. Jesus asked, how many loaves do you have in both? Jesus took the bread, thanked God, and, and broke it. We talked about that. Food multiplied in the hands of Jesus in both. The people ate and were satisfied in both. And the last one that I found was there's a large amount of leftovers in both. Or some leftovers. Brian and then Ron. One other that uh, just came to mind is in both cases they were a demonstration of Christ's compassion. Okay. Yep. That's a word that appeared in both yep. stories. So we can add that one. And Ron? They both used a boat. Okay. Both used a boat. Didn't grab that one either. Yep, Paul? The disciples in both of them were sort of leery of what could happen. In okay. Yep. All right. So, then on the other hand, what are the differences? Something that stood out to me is that the first one, the disciples brought the situation to Jesus' attention, and the second one, Jesus mentions it to the disciples. Okay, yep, definitely. So definitely the, the first biggest difference should, should grab you is what? Between the two stories. The numbers. Yeah, the numbers. Okay. So you got 5,000 compared to 4,000. That was a difference. Well, they weren't standing still the first time. Okay. The second time, they counted them twice. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other differences? Who provided the food? The first story was a young boy, and then the second story was food that they carry themselves. Okay, yeah. Yeah, definitely. The thing that catches my eye is the disciples saw it was there for the first feeding and they still couldn't figure out the second feeding. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They had no clue. They didn't remember. They didn't want to remember. They, they didn't know where it was coming from. They already yep. knew that he had done it before. So okay. Not stopping yep. this time. True. Yeah. How about the bread was five loaves in one and seven loaves in the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Teresa? I just have a question. Uh-huh. In, in chapter 6, it says fragments. It doesn't say whether it was meat or or bread. But mm -hmm. in, in chapter 8, it said meat. Yeah, it says what? Meat. Meat, yeah. So so, Again, if you, yeah. So if you piece other gospels, it's all leftovers. 
whether it was bread and meat or just one or the other. It's, yeah, it's all leftovers, all fragmented, maybe. All right, what about this difference? Leftovers were 12 small baskets compared to seven large baskets in the two, in the two okay, there. Or what about one came after a day of teaching and the 5,000 and the 4,000, it says they were with Jesus already three days and he was teaching them. So there's a difference. Or one met a spiritual need and one met a physical need. One was to the Jews and one was to the Gentiles. The 5,000, it was Jewish people. The 4,000 were Gentiles. And so you got two different crowds for two different feedings there. Okay? Now, how would some, even today, try to explain these miracles of these feeding of the multitudes? How do some try to explain these feedings? In Mark 6 and Mark chapter 8, how, how do some try to explain those? I've heard it said that some, some believe that the people in the crowd had food that they weren't sharing initially. And then when they saw what Jesus was doing, they brought it out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so if Anthony showed, if, if Chris is, is uh, Andrew and he finds Anthony with his little launch, now all of a sudden he stands up and says, hey, we found this, this, this young lad with his launch. We don't know how much it can feed. And then, and then Keith stands up and says, oh, oh, I got some. And Ron says, oh, I brought some. Austin says, I got some. And everybody starts to bring out, some will say, yeah, everybody was kind of holding back until somebody appeared to say, here's some. So that's one explanation of how some see this. Yeah, Megan? Maybe they had more money than they let on and they actually went to town and bought okay. a year's worth of wages. Yeah, yeah. So maybe some are holding out in their, their money as well. But still, they're gonna have to go a long way to get some food. But they could do it. Anything else that people try to explain? Yeah, Chris. It's and like, then Anthony. It's like the communion bread. No matter how small it is, everybody just keeps taking a smaller, yeah. smaller piece. So yeah. Everybody yeah. gets some. Yep. Yep. And then Anthony, you had your hand? Um, no? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Back to Mark 8. Mark chapter 8. We read 1 through 10 already. How long had the people been with Jesus? Three days. Three days. They've been with Jesus three days. And what concern did Jesus have for them? Here. What concern does he have? He would send them away. They might perish. Okay. If we send them away, they might collapse. So that something worse could happen to them. Okay. So he's got this deep concern for them. And what concern did the disciples have, though? I'm finding food to feed them. Now we've got to find some food. We're out here in the middle of we're, Again, we're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no it, food around. No food around. It just seemed impossible to them. So their, their answer in both cases was probably, we just need to get this crowd out of here. Yeah. We can't do it. Yeah. So we need to find a way to get them out of here. You know, yeah. it's impossible. Yeah. They keep pressing forward. They want something. Right? They want this food. Okay. How much food was available here? How how much did they have? How many loaves did they have? Yeah. Verse five. At seven, at seven loaves in, in verse five. All right. How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. Now, obviously, how did they know that number right away? All right, they could have already looked. Or they could have what? 
maybe it's theirs. Maybe it's theirs. Yeah. And maybe it's theirs even from the leftover of the 5,000. Don't know. Or it's just theirs personally after the 5,000. They got in the habit of bringing some along. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But one, the first one, they went looking. Here, they just kind of know the answer right away, it seems to me. Okay. There. And what happened after the people ate? Here? All right, they ate the fish. Uh, in verse 8, and they were satisfied, and then as Paul was saying, they picked up the seven basketfuls of broken pieces. In both cases, the amount that was picked up was more than the original amount. Yeah. Right? Yes. Um, and just kind of showing that when Jesus does a thing, he does it completely. Everybody gets all they want, and they end up with more than when they started. Yep. That's right. They ate and they were satisfied. I read that in both passages and to me it, it rings of a buffet. They ate and they were satisfied. Kept helping themselves or more were brought to them as well. The baskets in Mark 6 versus basket full in Mark Eight. So my typing, my fingers messed up in typing. Should be Mark six, Mark eight. There. Uh, and so the people ate, and there were seven baskets of broken pieces left to be picked up. All right. The basket referred to in the hold on, the basket referred to in the feeding of the five thousand was a small basket, su sufficient for a person to carry to handle. Yes. Where did the baskets come from? <laughs> People must have been carrying them. Yeah. I guess. I, the baskets. Yeah, I don't. Good question. Never thought about well, that one. Seven left. So yeah. Yeah, you would think. Please return to. And, and so in the feeding of the 5,000, you, you got this. They had basketfuls left over, which meant it was a basket that one person could carry. Okay? Small picnic basket, we might say. But in the 4,000... In Mark 8, it refers to a large basket, big enough to hold a man. It's the same word used for the word basket that lowered Paul down the outer wall in Acts chapter 9. And so in one miracle, you've got a small basket with leftovers. And in another miracle, you've got a basket <laughs> of leftovers. So Matt, is that something that in the, like, are there two different Greek words? Two different Greek words. Because it doesn't get translated. Correct. Right. So to me, you've got a small little basket, and then you've got a stretcher. Big enough for a man, I guess, depending on how big your man was, all right, to lower down, you've got a basket big enough for a person to be in. That's what was left over. Now, probably in both, Miracles. What did they do with these baskets that were left over then? Did they just leave them on the grassy knoll for anybody, for the birds? Or do you think something might have happened with these baskets that were left over in each reading? I mean, I have a sense. For, I mean, we're not told, but I mean, I have a sense in my own personal thought. I just wanted to hear from you first. So we know in chapter 8, or a few verses later, that they forgot to bring bread. So it sounds like they didn't take it with them that time. Okay. So maybe they handed it out to the peeps. That's what I think. That on the way out, after it was done, 
After it was time to leave, they're handing out these baskets full of, oh, by the way, the nice family, here you go, here's a couple baskets on your way out. <laughs> Please stay. Because these people have to journey home, don't they? And if they don't have anything to eat, they're going to be in the same predicament. Go ahead. This is kind of the same problem we have. When we've had big meals here, and maybe we've provided you know, meat or whatever, like the, the hog roast. Yeah. And a lot of times we're like, there's bags of food left over. Like, oh, take some home. Take yep. some home. You, you try to get people to take it home. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what's happening here. Yes, Sue. Well, some people have traveled a long distance, too. So I imagine that the people that were close by didn't take it. The people that were, you know, they had provision to go home because they had just Particularly the Gentiles that come along at this. Yeah. Yep. Mike. All these people will be going back to their homes and their cities and they're carrying all this food with them. They mm -hmm. left with some, but they're coming mm -hmm. back with more. And now what is going to happen? Let me tell you what happened. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just a way to yeah. share the miracle to much more than yeah. even the four or five right. thousand that you've mentioned. Yeah. Yep. Because we know even in John 6 and other places where, you know, again, if you came in later, this is the feeding of the 5,000 is one of the two that are only in all four Gospels. So, so you have other references to see that people are starting that later on. People are going to start to follow Jesus because they had something to eat from him. And they think, hey, that's a, a free meal ticket. And, and quickly, Jesus is going to put an end to that. <laughs> you know. Say, no, 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 that's not what it's all about. There. All right. Well, good. All right. How about some lessons for us? Okay. I think the first thing we learn is Jesus is the universal Savior here. In the feeding of the 5,000, it's made up of Jewish people, as we said. The feeding of the 4,000 is the Gentiles, and he wants the disciples, he wants us to know that Jesus, that he came to seek and save people of every nation and kindred and tongue. As John would write in the book of Revelation. That he is for all people. He just didn't come for one, he came for all. And so he is the universal Savior. I think we see that in these two miracles. Jesus is more than sufficient to meet the needs that people have. All right? He's more than sufficient to meet the needs that exist in our lives. It doesn't matter how big your giant is, how tall your mountain is, how deep your valley is, Jesus can meet your need. He supplies what we need as we need it. Maybe not exactly at that moment, but it's his time, not ours. The third lesson is Jesus has all we want. He has all we need, sorry. So as the baskets of leftovers were collected, you know, they, they probably took them home Ask people to take them home for the journey. And then, as Mike shared, they then have a story to tell of how they had a, a want and the need was taken care of by Jesus. There. Let's pause and talk about any questions on these first three lessons. Yes, Carol. Something that I was thinking about with the disciples um, when Jesus was testing them the first time. And give them a hard time the thought process though for me how how we approach things but they just came through doing all these miracles you know they seen starting with jesus turning the water into wine all these things that jesus had been doing that they were witnesses to and you think that they would be kind of like okay what are you going to do you know kind of this anticipation of like wow you know all these things we've seen and we just finished doing all these miracles they don't have any food. What are you going to do? And I think that just that question had, would have been the showing of faith. You know, like, they need food. How are you going to fix it? Yeah. Um, not that they had to have a solution. 
but we always fall into the how are we going to fix it. And, and I've been thinking about that this year with all of the different overwhelming things of, you know, looking at it more from the adventure, like, wow, <laughs> look what just happened. How's God going to fix that? Instead of how are we going to fix it? How are we, you know, it's all on us. And they went immediately to that. It's all on us. We yeah. can't do it. It's impossible. Yeah. Brian? Well, I was thinking too, and John really emphasizes this in, in the chapters that follow. One of the things that Jesus is doing, we talked about proving who he is, is he has, he has to basically show them that he is everything and more than what they, what they knew from their history. And so, you know, this, these two miracles are showing them you remember how you how concerned you were that, that they got manna in the desert, you know, and, and, and the Pharisees would come and say, you know, you know, Moses gave them manna, what are you gonna give us? You know, and he said, Well, let me show you. I have the ability to do that. Now it's not ultimately about physical food. Um, it's ultimately about spiritual bread, right? Yeah. But but yeah, but that's the point, is he, he's proving to them that, hey, that manna in the desert, yes. I have that power as well, you know, just so that they, they don't keep wanting to go back and say, well, we're going to stick to this old way. <laughs> Jesus is, with all his miracles, he takes all of that away and says, no, this is the new way. Yeah. Good. Sue. This kind of ties this in. This is also Christ as prophecy, because in Ezekiel, in, in 34, but before that, when Ezekiel is talking about explaining the fall of Jerusalem in 33, but in 34, then this message came to me from the Lord, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds, the leaders of Israel, <coughs> give them this message from the sovereign Lord, what sorrow awaits you shepherds who feed yourselves and study your flocks, shouldn't shepherds feed their sheep? And so this is prophecy too. Yeah. And Christ was up at that That's in right. the here. Yeah. Anybody else? And we probably want to sit and say, man, didn't those disciples know? I mean, they should have known. They should have learned. Right? They they two chapters earlier, five thousand. Wouldn't it have been great when we would have got to chapter 8 of Mark and all of a sudden it would have said, and the people followed and Peter said, hey, remember what just happened? Let's have the people sit down in hundreds and fifties and thousands and watch what Jesus does. <laughs> but we're, the, we're just like the disciples. We forget sometimes. We forget what God has done and what he's doing. What we go on with the lessons is we are people of little faith sometimes. They'd already witnessed this, this great feeding. But now they got doubts. They don't remember. Then we learn that God is not stingy. He proved more than, than, than enough for these people that, that he gave them more than enough. He, he didn't just say, okay, for you, here is your little meal and, and for you here is a big combo meal he said no father I bless this food and then the people ate and were satisfied they didn't have to wonder I wonder if I can go up for seconds or thirds they ate and they were satisfied he's not stingy he gives us love he gives us mercy he gives us grace. He gives us blessings more than we can ask or imagine. Great things can happen if we put the need in the hands of Jesus. Maybe we need to stop trying to figure it out by ourselves and just trust Jesus. Maybe we just need to say, you know, I'm, I'm just going to give this into your hands, Jesus. Uh, kind of like this year. I don't know what's going on, but I just want to trust Jesus. Don't know what it's going to look like as we continue throughout the year, but I'm just trusting that I'm going to put it in the hands of Jesus. Because when 
the food got in the hands of Jesus, what happened to it? Multiply. It multiplied from the blessing. So lessons that we can learn to help us as well. Anything before we close up today that you want to bring out from these two great feedings of the multitude? I didn't look at Yeah, go ahead. I was thinking a little bit, you know, that they said them in groups of hundreds and, and, and fifties and hundreds, right? Yeah. And I think about you know, like a meal we serve here, uh, like let's say one part of it, like the uh, mystery dinner. We probably got 12 people that work in the kitchen to help distribute all the food. And they've got 12 of them that are distributing the <laughs> 10, 15 times that. <laughs> not only is that a lot of people, a lot of space, they need a lot of room for them all, but that takes a lot of time to get that all out and get everybody fed and pick up everything afterwards and, and such. It's just interesting. That, you know, it doesn't seem like in the you know couple of sentences there, but through the logistics of it, that's, that's a large yeah. undertaking. Yeah. I thought about that yesterday as I was leaving here and I drove around the parking lot all the way around and I thought, man, what if we had groups of 50 starting over at the outreach center in the grass? <laughs> and somebody had to sit in the stones and then in the parking lots and maybe in here and then behind the building and then in these parking lots and then out in the grass. And then, like you said, the 12 people coming out of the kitchen thinking, where are we going to go? Who? And somebody would have to say, hey, you, you, you go that way, you go in the back, and we'll start over here. They had to have a plan, you would think. You know? I, and I, I hope that nobody sat there thinking, I, I didn't get, they got fed first. I didn't get fed yet. I want the food. You know? We don't see that. Hopefully that didn't happen. They, they got fed. They waited. Yeah, good point. You and then Teresa. Yeah, so uh, I'm a little hesitant on this because we don't want to take it the wrong way, but in, in Mark 6, remember their original goal was to go get some rest. Mm -hmm. They were weary from work they had already done, but they didn't get at least the kind of rest they were expecting because the crowd showed up. Jesus said, okay, we're going we're gonna to help this crowd. And, you know, he, he, he taught them a lot, and then they, they fed so they still weren't getting physical rest, yeah. but perhaps the, 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 if God gives you what you need physically in order to accomplish what needs to be done. So, you know, they, they probably felt at least good about what had happened, yeah. even if physically they didn't get the rest they needed. Yeah. But the reason I'm cautious of like it, we shouldn't think, there are some folks who think, well, I just gotta work, work all the time, you know, trying to serve God, because I, I love it and want to do that. But there are times when rest is appropriate. Yeah. But there are other times when God will give you what you need to power through That's right. to take care of whatever yeah. needs to happen. Yeah. Good point. Teresa? I just wondered if they were sitting in awe at being fed by the saint. <laughs> Would hope. Being fed by the Savior. All right. Yeah, Paul. I was wondering too. Uh, the reason uh, Jesus chose a hill to stand on, or took him out to the hill country, mm -hmm. is so that possibly they all could hear him because the voice. Yeah. I don't know how loud he spoke, but that it spread. Yeah, the voice would carry. Yep. Yep. Good point. All right, next week we're going to look at this great story, The Widow's Son Raised in Luke chapter 7, 11 through 17. So if you want to jot that down on your bulletin or uh, remember it, take a picture of it, that's what we're going to look at. That's going to be our parable, or our miracle, sorry, our miracle next week. Probably a story we don't look at a lot. Uh, and that's what Brian and I were trying to look at, some maybe that we don't spend a lot of time all right, let's not pray together. Father, we thank you for our time in this class, and thank you for those who might have uh, watched online as well, and uh, just pray your blessing as we uh, dig deep into your word every day. And Father, we thank you that you gave us your son, and that Jesus said he is the bread of life. And Father, uh, bless us as we uh, look at these miracles, as, as we ponder 
what they mean and, and how we can apply them to our lives. Keep us safe through this week. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Am I in the wrong spot?